Hi everyone, um, I'm really excited to be here um, and talk to you about serverless GraphQL. Um, so just a really quick um, overview of my background. So I studied engineering at Cambridge and then I did a coding school in London called Founders and Coders. Um, and since then I've been working um, as a developer with an organization called Dwill. Um, and now I'm studying at Harvard for a year as a graduate student. Um, and I want to talk to you today about three things. So using AWS Lambda, API Gateway, and GraphQL together to build serverless applications. Um, I also want to share some of the lessons that we've learned um, and some of the tips that I uh, can give you from having implemented um, a serverless GraphQL application. Um, and lastly, I want to share some other cool things um, that I've come across. So earlier this year, I worked on a project with the Thomas Cook Group um, to implement um, uh, the next generation holiday search platform. And for this, we were using a completely serverless architecture. Um, and in particular, the interesting thing about this application was an API facade, which was built using um, AWS API Gateway, AWS Lambda, and GraphQL. So just to get an idea of everyone's background, who's used Lambda before? Give me a show of hands. It's quite a lot of you. The API Gateway. Um, and what about GraphQL? Okay, so slightly few of you use GraphQL, but um, so I'll quickly run through the, uh, the basics of Lambda just for those of you who haven't come across it before. So AWS Lambda um, enables you to use functions as units of deployment. So individual functions can be deployed as Lambda functions and triggered by events. So this enables a microservices architecture to be um, realized in the cloud. And um, AWS in particular have made this really appealing by having a pay per execution model um, and a really generous free tier, which make Lambda really, um, really easy to access and, and very cheap to play with. So this is just an example of a Lambda function. So the important things to notice here are just how it can be invoked with an event, a context, and a callback. So Lambda by itself is really exciting, but it gets even more exciting when you pair it with the API Gateway. So the API Gateway enables you to expose public HTTP endpoints, and these endpoints can map to Lambda functions. Um, so API Gateway is also really exciting in that it has a paper call model and a really generous free tier. So at Thomas Cook, we were using API Gateway and Lambda together with GraphQL. And so GraphQL is an application-level query language that was developed by Facebook and offers an alternative to a traditional REST API. Um, and the really, uh, really useful thing about GraphQL is uh, this idea of a schema. And the schema is a model of the data that can be accessed from um, this GraphQL server. Uh, and then the key advantages of GraphQL are firstly that there's client-specified queries so the client requests exactly the information that they need, and the server only returns that information. So there's no overfetching of data. And it also enables um, multiple data sources to be queried um, within a single query. So you only have a single trip to the server. So you can fetch data from multiple sources with a single query and a single trip to the server. And there's some other also interesting things like introspection, which enable the API to be self-documenting. So these are the three technologies that we were using. Um, but instead of deploying GraphQL as a server, uh, the interesting thing that we did was to deploy it as a Lambda function. So the entire API for this application was accessible through a single endpoint slash GraphQL. So no matter how many different backends your application uses, the client only ever needs to, to be aware of this single endpoint. So just to give you an idea of the structure of the application, and the UI was a static website, which was hosted from an S3 bucket. This then made requests to a um, single endpoint in the API gateway, which would then uh, trigger this GraphQL API facade Lambda function. And this GraphQL Lambda function would then um, distribute the data fetching to multiple other microservices, which were each deployed, again, as separate Lambda functions. 
So GraphQL really acts as this API facade. It distributes the data fetching based on the query, and it aggregates the responses, and then sends them back to the client. And, and each type in the GraphQL schema has its own resolve function. So the resolve function can map to a Lambda function. So each of your types can fetch data from different sources by um, distributing the data fetching to multiple other microservices, which are each deployed as Lambda functions. So this enables a really modular application. And this is enabled um, by AWS Lambda. So to give you an idea of what all this actually involves, so I understand it's, qu it's quite abstract, it's quite hard to get your head around it. Um, I built this GraphQL serverless jukebox, and I want to show you how this works and how a query flows through this application. So it's really simple. It's just a jukebox. You can search for songs, add them to a playlist, and you can save a playlist. Um, but this breaks down to a really interesting architecture, which I want to walk you through. So the UI is, again, just a static S3 website, um, which for which I use React. Uh, this then makes requests to the single endpoint on the API gateway, slash GraphQL, which maps to a GraphQL Lambda function. And this is the API facade. So there's multiple other microservices that this Lambda function can delegate to. So there's an API, and there's a, there's a microservice which gets songs from a third-party API. There's another microservice which saves songs to an S3 um, bucket. There's another Lambda function which retrieves songs from an S3 bucket. And this GraphQL Lambda function is what, um, is, is what, is what delegates the data fetching um, and uh, other, uh, delegates the other microservices based on what's requested by the client in the query. So I'm going to walk you through the path of a query through this um, application. So the client uh, makes requests to the API endpoint, which then triggers this Lambda function. And when this Lambda function is triggered, um, the information from the client is sent in this event object. So specifically, there's a query, and then there are variables. And these are then resolved against the GraphQL schema, which you've defined. So this is the schema. Um, what does the schema look like? So for my application, the schema has um, two areas. It has a query, which is which I like get requests. So I can ask for song suggestions, and I can also get my playlist. And then there's also mutation, which is um, like a post request. So I want to add a song to my playlist. So taking a closer look at the suggestions query, the suggestions query has um, a type. So here it's a suggestions list type. And this type has several different fields. So I can get the name of the song, I can get the artist, I can get the URL, or I can get the image URL. And this is the sort of structure of the data that can be fetched. And this type also has a resolve function. And this resolve function maps to another Lambda function. So whenever I request data of this particular type, it then triggers another Lambda function and here, this Lambda song suggester makes a request to a third-party API to retrieve song suggestions. So if I was to send a query um, to ask for song suggestions, and in particular, I just want the name and the artist, and I send as, qu as query variables purple, and I say I only want four songs, my response would look something like this. So the, the shape of the response exactly matches the shape of the query, and I get four responses and it only get the name and the artist. So it's very declarative. You don't overfetch data, um, and it's very easy to, to reason about. So one of the other cool things about GraphQL is it comes with this IDE called Graphical. So uh, it's a really useful developer tool. So you can explore the schema, build up different queries, and then see what the actual returned response looks like. So we really think this is a, a new way of building serverless APIs. Um, so in particular, you can uh, have a very complex architecture, but the client is only ever aware of this single endpoint. Um, and they can fetch all the data that they need in a single round trip to the server. So what are some of the good parts um, of using a serverless GraphQL architecture? So firstly, you can deploy each function individually. So the microservices architecture makes it um, really modular and, and really easy to update 
functions um, individually. Um, you can keep all your microservices really simple. So the one Lambda function that gets songs from the third party API, that's all it does. That's all it has to worry about. Um, there's also some other benefits of using Lambda, namely the pricing model and the free tier. So what are the slightly scary parts or the things that you might have to worry about? Um, so having this microservices architecture is, makes it really modular, but it also makes it very hard to debug things. So you have to follow um, the path of the query and figure out where the error is. That becomes really difficult as the, uh, as the number of moving parts in your architecture increases. So you have to be very careful about having good integration testing. Um, and also, you might have to start worrying about latency issues if you have, say, multiple Lambda functions that are executed in series. So some tips. So how do you tame your microservices? So we had a separate repository per microservice. Um, but this can get quite difficult to manage, especially if you have you know, 10, 20 different microservices, you have to hop between different repos. And um, so that becomes quite complicated. Um, you also need to make sure that you document interfaces really clearly between microservices. So um, what, what, what are the shape of the, um, what parameters should I specify in the event objects to invoke a different Lambda function? All these uh, interfaces need to be documented really clearly. And we also had to have a lot separate deployment scripts so we didn't have to manually deploy to AWS, um, and also uh, make sure that we had local invoke scripts, so we didn't, have to, we didn't have to deploy to AWS every time we wanted to test something. So these are the difficulties that we faced um, without using um, a serverless framework um, and doing everything ourselves. Um, so, so if you want to learn about AWS, we also actually created some resources. So if, if you're interested and excited about this, go and and learn about AWS Lambda for those of you who haven't already learned about it. And we also actually created lots of resources um, to help with deployment and testing, so you can have a look at those too. So that's just a very quick overview of serverless um, and using AWS Lambda with GraphQL and the API Gateway to build a serverless application. Um, I just wanted to end by sharing some other cool things, so how to add authentication to your GraphQL a serverless application. Um, and also at the end, I want to show you an example of uh, why I think GraphQL is so powerful as an alternative to a REST API. So firstly, authentication. So if you're building a REST API, you obviously want to make sure that um, users can only access things that they are allowed to access. And with GraphQL, this becomes really easy um, with the addition of this viewer parameter. So the viewer is something that's accessible in all of the GraphQL resolve functions. So you can pass in, for example, here, an authentication token um, from auth to zero. So inside my resolve function, I have access to this viewer object. And then I can check, does this viewer have permission to retrieve that playlist? Um, so I can very easily add authentication to a GraphQL API. So all the code for this is on, uh, on GitHub. If you want to go and have a look, check it out, try it out for yourself, and, and submit issues and pull requests if you have things you'd like to add. So lastly, I just wanted to share something that I um, built last year. Um, and it just gives a really good example of how GraphQL is really powerful. So when Austin invited me to come and speak, he mentioned that um, GitHub are releasing a GraphQL API. Um, and that reminded me of a project that I built when I first learned how to code. And it was built on top of the GitHub API. So I'm just going to really quickly show it to you. Um, it's called Code Crystal. And the problem we were trying to solve is whenever you're uh, looking at someone else's code or you're trying to review someone's code, it's quite hard to figure out what are the important files in this project or what files should I be looking at and how do different files link to each other. And um, so I built this up with a couple of friends. And what it does is you say which um, repository you're looking at, who is the user, and what's re who's the owner, who's the repo, and what branch you want to look at. And it creates this interactive map of all the files in your repo and how they're linked to each other. So these are all the NPM modules. You can see 
this is the server, um, and the server requires all these files. And, and all, this is a, it's a very simple application. All it does is get um, the commit from your repo, get all the files in that commit, and then the contents of each file, and then we just pass the files to look for module.exports and um, import. And it's a very simple application built on top of the GitHub API. But making calls to the GitHub API can get really complicated. So here, I dug out this code earlier today, and I was looking at it. And as you can see, there's so many nested callbacks. So there's the first function gets the latest commit from that repo. The next function gets the list of files in that repo. And then the next function gets the contents of each of those files. And if you have, say, 100 files in your repo, that's 102 individual calls to the GitHub API, which can get really inefficient. But with GraphQL, you have the power to turn this into a single request um, and a single GraphQL query. And you don't overfetch data, and you just get the data that you need in a single query in a very declarative fashion. Um, so, that's, so I think that GraphQL really has the power to transform the way APIs are built. Um, so if you want to have a look at the code for that app, it's also on GitHub. It's just a pet project that I really wanted to share. Um, so yeah, that's all I wanted to talk about today. Um, if you want to have a look at any of the code, it's all on GitHub. And you can send me a tweet if you have any questions. Um, but yeah, thank you very much.